It's time for the Bible Geek. I am that geek. Robert M. Price, Robert M. Price, postmodern, deconstruct, super-powered demigod. I guess it's time for the Bible Geek again. It's a couple of days after Christmas, and uh, boy, did I have a great one. I hope you did. And uh, uh, let's see, uh, I got a couple of little announcements, as always. Uh, I, I guess it's too late for it to be a Christmas gift, but you ought to check out Murray Sheehan's novel, Eden, published in 1928. Uh, Ed Suwoman and his publishing it, reprinting it with a, an introduction by Ed and me. Um, it's uh, that that is it'll be intellectual press, the same press that published uh, Ed and my uh, book, uh, Evolving Out of Eden. And this is so fascinating. I, I always like to say how great I think it is because it has a very wise and sardonic and somehow cynical yet poetic treatment of the creation of Adam and Eve and uh, the uh, the uh, invention of religion once Adam and Eve left the garden and the uh, the oppression of women that resulted, and yet it isn't preachy and political politically correct. You don't feel like you're being lectured. It is just really fascinating. The main character is is Lilith. We've talked about her quite a number of times here. I think you'd really get a huge kick out of this book. Um, let's see. Also, um, uh, let's see. Uh, if you're interested in uh, argumentation and critical thinking, and I know you are, I would suggest you look into Bo Bennett's new online course on logical fallacies. Uh, he explains in detail dozens of the most common fallacies how to detect them, how to avoid uh, using them, and he's got uh, audio visual content of. Uh, uh, this guy should teach logic, and my favorite part of uh, logic is always the informal fallacies, and uh, that's what he deals with, and uh, I think uh, you'd, you'd really enjoy this also. You can uh, sign up at BibleGeek.MasteringLogicalFallacies.com, BibleGeek.MasteringLogicalFallacies.com, and there's no spaces in there. Uh, I think you'd really enjoy this. Okay, this from Tim in England. Chatting to some of my Christian friends, they came out with a couple of familiar tropes. Uh, your erudite elucidations, please. One, God is holy and can't be in the presence of sin. I pointed out that not only can God do anything, when he was incarnate as Jesus, he sought out the sinners. Is there any biblical basis for the claim that God can't be in the presence of sin? Uh, I uh, don't think so, but what the, what they're usually thinking of is a passage... Uh, or at least the slogan is derived from the passage uh, in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously? Uh, wherefore, uh, look, as that's a question, right? Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? So this is one of these gutsy uh, complaints to God that you find often in the Bible that you would never find if modern uh, evangelicals had written it. Uh, what is the point of this? Of course, the writer is saying bad things are happening. Why are you letting it happen, God? I thought you were intolerant of evil, yet you're letting it run rampant. Sometimes surprising to find uh, refreshing stuff like that in the Bible. But the point is, of course, uh, really that uh, not that God is blinded to it, uh, or it's like uh, Superman can't look upon anything uh, inside a lead-lined box, uh, even though he has x-ray vision ordinarily. It doesn't really mean that. It's just a way of saying God cannot stand the sight of sin. Right, and uh, that's uh, it, there's no literal cannot. It's just that he hates sin, wickedness, etc. So I don't think that's really a, a problem. Um, I, I have heard it uh, theologized in a clever, 
understandable but I think ridiculous way when uh, people try to explain what Jesus says from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? Well, that's part of the Psalm 22 that he's quoted, the, quoting there. And people take that literally. I, I remember at least years ago hearing that. Why did God turn his back on Jesus on the cross? Well, he had been made sin for us, as I think Second Corinthians says. And therefore, he had to turn his back. He had to turn away because he cannot look upon sin. That's really solving one problem by creating a worse one. And uh, and and it isn't a problem, either one of them, right? If if you ask what is going on in um, Mark's uh, passion narrative, Mark 15, well, Jesus is depicted as quoting Psalm 22, 1. And uh, you know what I think, right, that this didn't even happen and that Mark has compiled the whole crucifixion scene from Psalm 22, but if you don't think that and you think, yeah, this is an account of Jesus uh, suffering on the cross, well, then you would say, uh, okay, Jesus was quoting Psalm 22 and not just the beginning. It probably would mean he, he knew this psalm and was praying because it's a psalm that was for anybody to pray in the temple when you were uh, you know up to your nose in trouble. And you're saying, gee, it looks like God is, just like the Habakkuk thing, uh, God is uh, is not helping me. Uh, but, uh, you know, why? Uh, well, if you read to the end of the, the psalm, it's obvious that even though it's the 11th hour, uh, the, the one who is pr- offering this prayer is not, in fact, giving up on God, saying, even now I expect your deliverance. So there's no problem, really, with uh, imagining Jesus should say this. Um, I mean, you could read it in a way that would imply that, uh, ignoring the psalm context, and you ju- he's just saying, hey, what's, uh, why, uh, why'd you leave me uh, hanging like this, twisting in the wind? Uh, but he, he, my point is, there's another very plausible reading, so I wouldn't try to torment fundamentalist friends with that. And and uh, but the I say you're making it worse if you say God cannot look upon evil. That's certainly that's not what the Psalm implies. Or the uh, the Habakkuk uh, things implies, and and it's no help in trying to deal with uh, Mark 15. Um, uh, even the idea of Jesus. Uh, fraternizing with sinners in order to win them over you know that you just have to think of the common phrase which isn't in the bible but certainly is not incompatible with it that god loves sinners but hates the sin uh that's not sophistry i mean suppose you have as you may have uh, a relative you love who has uh, gotten into drug addiction man you hate that sin but you love the sinner i don't think that's any kind of contrived thing Uh, And um, so the same would be true of of Jesus. He wouldn't be trying to get him to repent if he didn't hate the sin, but he doesn't hate sinners. Okay, uh, second one. uh, Infants who die go straight to heaven. This one, at least, is based on your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost or should perish. Uh, leaving aside whether they go straight away or have to wait for the rapture, I could not think of any basis for being able to make a post-mortem choice that could not be made during life. Could I ask the geek to comment? Actually, uh, Tim, I have to admit I'm not quite sure what you're getting at on that one. Um, I don't think it does specifically say little children not having made uh, a decision for Christ or whatever, not having repented, uh, are nonetheless going to heaven. Uh, but uh, it, I think it is a fair inference, and, and it does come very close. I, I would pick a different passage from Mark, though, where he, the uh, you know, Jesus is uh, swamped with people, and pr- people are bringing their babies uh, for Jesus to bless. And uh, and the disciples, uh, self-important guardians of Jesus, as they think, saying, don't shove that baby in the Savior's face. I love that scene in The Life of Brian. Um, as I was saying it, I looked over to the left and saw my uh, my uh, Brian 
doll there that I uh, got years ago uh, to inspire me. Um, if that's uh, so, what does Jesus say? What, what do you think you're doing? Uh, the, the, of such, uh, let the little children come to me. Don't uh, push them away. For the, uh, of these is the kingdom of heaven made. Well, the way I render it in the pre-Nicene New Testament is, don't you recognize them? These are the very angels of the kingdom of God. Uh, I kind of think that's what he means, but it, even if he doesn't, it's like saying, if you go to heaven, you'll find it populated by souls like these. They don't need to repent yet. Uh, and uh, if they die, well, they got nothing to repent of. Doesn't have uh, any doctrine of original sin in view there. Um so, uh, oh well, okay, uh, let me know, Tim, if that isn't adequate. It probably is not, uh, so please correct my thick-headedness here and let me know more specifically uh, what you're asking if that ain't it. Uh, let's see. This is from uh, a DC-based geek, and he doesn't mean um, DC Comics, um, though that would be quite good too. Uh, living as I do near the nation's capital, I was most interested to learn recently of a Bible museum in the works, and I'm sure many fellow geeks will be as well if they aren't already. A September 14th um, uh, Washington Post magazine article discusses it, and uh, well, there's a long URL thing here. I'm sure you could just look up Washington Post online and look for Bible Museum. Uh, it will be situated near the Washington Mall. The man behind it is Steve Green, owner of Hobby Lobby, which won a Supreme Court case in opposition to Obamacare recently with a rather novel concept that a closely held for-profit corporation can have religious beliefs protected by the First Amendment. Does this mean that corporations can go to heaven or be damned to hell? Some might argue that uh, they're already damned by their tax burdens and a corporate inversion to the Cayman Islands is paradise, but I digress. It seems Mr. Green is a very wealthy man and has his own hobby of collecting ancient Bibles, a world-class collection. The Bible, sorry, saying the, the museum will house the collection and have three sections. History of the Bible, stories of the Bible, and impact uh, of the Bible. While Green is a conservative Christian and reportedly uh, has uh, stacked the non-profit board with the same, he professes an intent that the museum be non-sectarian and, quote, let the Bible speak for itself, unquote. While that may be difficult to pull off, I think he has made a big step forward in his selection of a head of the collection, none other than David Trobish, whose work I have not read, but I believe you hold in high esteem, you bet, uh, and if I recall, is known for his theory of Polycarp being a major editor-slash-redactor of the Gospels in the New Testament canon. My question for you is, is there any inside dope or other insights on the museum you might wish to share with us listeners? I, I don't know enough about it, but what little I do, which parallels what you've said, makes me think, uh, well, this is not like the Noah's Ark theme park or, uh, you know, creationist museum or any of that propaganda nonsense. Um, Ken Ham, I think, is the one with the Noah's Ark thing, and it just lost uh, government funding, and I think rightly so, because it's trying to push creationism, and uh, and th thus meaning that it's not like uh, a museum dedicated to the story of Noah's Ark, which might be quite interesting, uh, but is trying to push pseudoscience in the name of religious doctrine. You, you can't have the government funding that. But as far as I know, that's not what this is. I think it's good that people are biblically literate uh, and the impact of the Bible, yeah, why not? I think that's a good thing to, to educate people about. And the fact that he's sharing these uh, Bible copies he's had sounds great. And uh, with Trobish at the helm, I don't think you got anything to worry about. If anybody is a biblical critic, it's David Trobish. So uh, as far as I know, great idea. Um, the the fact that it's run by fundamentalists doesn't bother me in the least, as long as it's, again, not a creation museum or something. Hmm. 
and uh, this one from uh, uh, Johannes, oh boy, from Potsdam, Germany. Oh boy, I always love doing my bad German accents. Uh, uh, your most exalted geekiness, one of the favorite theodicies of contemporary apologetics is that evil and suffering occur as a result of mighty old Yahweh granting us free will because of his amazing love toward us and his desire for us to love him back freely. My impression is that the concept of free will is not something that can actually be found in the Bible. It appears that this is something the biblical authors are wholly unconcerned with. Am I right, or are there any parts of the Bible where human freedom is contemplated as something intended and valued by the creator of the universe? There are several biblical heroes who bargain or wrestle with God in a fascinating way, including Job, uh, Abraham, and Jacob. So uh, human freedom is something uh, which is depicted as an important factor in the inter- interaction between Yahweh and humanity. But as it appears in the stories, human freedom to act independently of divine will is simply a given, not something existing by divine decree. If we take Genesis 2, it appears that human freedom is something which came to be by accident, by which Yahweh feels genuinely threatened. So is my impression correct that the invocation of free will as an excuse for why God permits suffering is merely a post hoc rationalization, or could there be more to it? Uh, Did the ancient Greeks have anything to say about whether the gods wanted us to have free will, or is this a question which became acute only in the Enlightenment age? Now let me just pause there. I think you've put it well. I don't think it really comes up as uh, an issue. In Galatians, it says uh, that Christ has made you free. Don't become a slave again. But uh, and, but it's talking about uh, freedom from the Torah. And uh, apparently it's talking about Gentile converts. And people are trying to enslave them to the Torah. And I believe implicit in that is the notion of the Gentile converts chafing at taking on to themselves the burden of alien cultural mores. Now, wait a minute, I, I'm not supposed to eat pork? If I'm a Christian, I can't eat shrimp? Uh, why is that? Oh, the, the Torah? You mean I got to become Jewish in order to become a Christian? Well, that was the issue. And uh, the Pauline epistles say, no, no, you don't have to do that. And of course, the point is that for Jews, it wasn't a burden. It wasn't slavery. It wasn't a yoke. You'd have the same problem if you went to some Asian or African country, right, with uh, different mores that are no problem for them. They're like a fish in water, uh, just like people uh, from other countries trying to adjust to our way of life might find it a bit difficult. (laughs) Learning English by itself must be uh, a burden. No, they're, they're talking about uh, the uh, well, there, it gets into a kind of a Gnostic worldview that you're enslaved to the laws actually promulgated by the archons, the principalities and powers. Uh, that I think that is the original point of the Pauline material, but it's been mitigated and harmonized uh, uh, with Judaism as much as Catholic theologians, early Catholic theologians, could uh, could do it. Um, I don't think freedom and free will per se really are uh, brought up. The closest to it would be in Romans, where we're told that human sin serves to magnify God's righteousness, uh, that uh, everything God says in judgment is always right. And then uh, the writer says, now I know what you're going to say, you know, if... if, uh, if my sin uh, causes uh, God benefit by his glorification, why does he blame me for the sin? And he says, well, who, who are you to talk back to God? It's up to him to, uh, 
he's the the one that's uh, making he's the potter he can uh, take the same lump of clay and make it into a chalice or into a bedpan if he wants a spittoon that's up to him that's getting pretty close to saying that humans don't have free will but I don't think it ever goes very far and the Greeks had the same sort of idea with uh, hymarmone uh, fate that you can't really escape it no matter how you may try and uh, look at Oedipus right uh, he he's uh, trying to escape his fate but it, his very effort to do so brings about that which he fears uh, so uh, yeah I think there's I think you're you're right uh, that um, if anything there is the statement of limitation of uh, free will though uh, it, it isn't discussed in a philosophical way. This is one of those places where Tillich says the Bible does not speak in philosophical terms, yet it does raise questions that, uh, that, that call for philosophical treatment. And, of course, that's what happened when, it, uh, when theology uh, began to be formulated. Um, yeah, okay. Um, by the way, I think that theodicy is highly problematical that God wanted us to have free will, why did he have to do that? Uh, why couldn't he have just made us more like him? I mean, God is not bound to anything. God, It's like this earlier thing, God can't look upon sin. Well, if you took that literally, that'd be a problem, but it raises the issue of can God sin? Well, that's wrongly put because the idea is sin is always a function of weakness and limitation, which God does not have. So it's like saying, can God hobble along? Uh, can God uh, get cancer? Uh, no, because these things are functions of a limitation that God does not have. Uh, and uh, so it's it's the same sort of a thing. Why couldn't God have made us so we would freely do the right thing all the time? Uh, I don't know that that is a problem. But when you do say, yeah, the free will defense, you're uh, giving away the store. I mean, that's a real high-priced theology because it implies deism, that God's going to let you uh, sink or swim, and uh, it's up to you. I don't think people pursue that logically to its uh, appointed end, but that's what's got to happen. Okay, so I have the same question regarding several other concepts which feature very prominently in modern apologetics, but which seem hard to find anywhere in the biblical texts. Uh, first of all, the three omnis. Uh, Yahweh or Elohim is certainly depicted as an extremely powerful character, no question, but the concept of omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, let alone omnibenevolence, just seems not to match the Yahweh character of the Old Testament, who has lots, who has lots of all too human flaws. He is cranky, gets jealous, angry, he repents of his actions, gets tempted, and so on. Isn't the omni, 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 infinite God a la William Lane Craig a modern construct from the Enlightenment age or even later? Or can it somehow be grounded in the cosmovision of the ancient Hebrews of the worldview? I think uh, it's actually earlier than that. Uh, you start running into these problems with St. Augustine, uh, St. Anselm, and uh, certainly Thomas Aquinas, because what they've done is to, uh, to borrow uh, Pascal's um, term, they have tried to redo the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the God of the philosophers, and uh, it just doesn't work. It, it makes God an abstraction who does not experience the passage of time and therefore logically cannot act or even think in serial terms. You wind up, if you pursue it logically, with God as Satchitananda, as in uh, non-dualist Hinduism, being consciousness bliss. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, all these omni things uh, destroy biblical personalism. And this is why some uh, conservative theologians like my buddy Greg Boyd has gone over to personalism and said, look, uh, 
if you want to say this makes God like Zeus, well, in a way it does, but God is a person in time uh, and and so forth. So that's uh, a process the theology tried to avoid those implications, but I don't think it can. It just trades a different sort of abstraction. So it is old, at least a thousand years old, really more, uh, goes you know back into the fourth century and so on, uh, but it it's post biblical. That's for sure. Uh, I think you're right. God is not depicted as um, the cause of every effect. As in Calvinism, uh, he rather the idea is that, uh, like you say, God is so powerful that no one can gainsay him. Who could prevent God from doing what he wants to do and so forth? Uh, and um, it doesn't get into theoretical omniscience. Uh, uh, he catches the wise in their cleverness. He's smarter than anybody else, but is he constantly aware of every degree of shifting temperature on every star in the universe? I, they're not even thinking of that. So once you start speculating, it uh, gets to be uh, gets to be a bit of a mess. I think. I find Jack Miles is understand not Jack Hiles right, but Jack Miles, who yeah, the author is. I find Jack Miles's undertaking fascinating to examine the development of God as a literary character in his work God a Biography. Wouldn't an actually infinite, spaceless, timeless, immaterial, and unchanging God be totally? incapable of interacting with humanity in any meaningful manner? Wouldn't such a god be just as boring and irrelevant, say, as the number five in the Platonic realm of forms? Yeah, that's exactly what he would be, uh, it seems to me. It reminds me of a scene in one of Michael Moorcock's great Elric stories, where Elric, um, having uh, been born in the religion of chaos, worshiping the lords of chaos, uh, is, uh, he, he converts to, uh, to advancing the priorities of the lords of order, but then he has a vision of what a completely ordered world would be like, and it's kind of like a gallery of concrete, immobile statues, and so he switches again to championing the balance of order over chaos and uh, to me that's like uh, what he sees as pure order is like the sterile god robot of uh, philosophy all in all i wonder whether, whether modern apologetics is actually shoehorning the biblical god into a role of a quasi deistic god which is totally at odds with the god the ancient hebrews believed in could it be that the god of contemporary christianity has next to nothing to do with the god of the bible uh, well, Johannes, I think that is exactly right, except that they're inconsistent. Sometimes they do speak in terms of biblical personalism. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. He's enraged at sin. Th these things are completely incompatible with the implications of what they say philosophically about God. So they really have a kind of a Jekyll and Hyde God which reminds me of another great fantasy tale by Clark Ashton Smith called Schizoid Creator. Okay, this question is from Tristan in Maryland. I have a number of associates, friends, and co-workers from a non-Western setting, mostly India, Japan, and Pakistan, and it always astounds me how it is only the West which seems to have this identity crisis concerning religious, I'm sorry, religion, and cultural identity. For these folks, it seems that the religion they were raised with is just the fundamental truth for their people, and religions outside of that framework are just not really a threat or challenge. Now, I'm sure there are apostates from Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, but even folks who have since rejected that framework still identify closely with that religion. It's such a part of their culture. You know, just think of secular Jews, right? That too. Is Christianity the religion of the West? Is it something we should be trying to cleave from ourselves or trying to reform? Is there a point where Tillich's conception of deity as being is compatible with even atheism? Our, uh, well, yeah, uh, Heidegger said, 
he might one day write a theology, though I don't think he ever got around to it. He had been trained in a Catholic seminary. But he said against his buddy Tillich that being is not God, uh, though, you know, Tillich uh, did equate the two. Uh, are, uh, so based on what Heidegger says, yeah, you, you could certainly be a philosophical idealist believing that being and other seeming abstractions are more real, a platonic kind of thing, right, than material objects. So you certainly could be a platonic atheist. You know, there, there are spiritual or whatever realities, but there's no God per se. Okay, are atheists committing the same error as Martin Luther in operating... Uh, uh, what is this? Okay, uh, they make the same error Martin Luther did with uh, his principle of sola scriptura, scripture alone, by championing only reason in the atheist case and abandoning the tradition of Western Christianity. Any of this makes sense? Um yeah, uh, I I think they're, like uh, Richard Dawkins said, uh, he is a cultural Christian. He enjoys um, Christmas celebrations and the Christmas carols and all that stuff. He, he apparently is not trying to uh, suppress that, as a lot of my atheist buddies are, uh, who kind of seem to admire the enforced secularism of the old Soviet Union. Uh, and... Um, yeah, I, I at least think that Christianity uh, should or could be um, celebrated as, as a cultural inheritance in the same way that Reconstructionist Jews celebrate Judaism and the Torah. You don't have to believe in God to, to be in a Reconstructionist synagogue, but you do. Uh, you're there because you believe that the Torah and its laws and its traditions are the sancta of the Jewish people that they are the markers of the Jewish cultural and uh, cultural identity. This is a way of appreciating the role of religion in society and culture, even if philosophically you can't believe there is a God. I don't see anything inconsistent with that, and uh, I have often described myself as a Christian atheist. I don't know if I should anymore because I don't really go to church anymore. I'm kind of, I've kind of lost interest in it, but that may change. Who knows? I, I just don't think it, uh, appreciating or even participating in uh, uh, the traditions of a religion beg the question of whether there's a God or not. There's a lot else going on, as Carl Jung would say, uh, deep down in religion uh, without uh, taking literally the idea of a God. So, thanks, yeah. Okay. Uh, greetings, geek and all geekim. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, uh, let me go down to the bottom and see who this is. Justin. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm watching some of Margaret Barker's videos on YouTube, trying to understand her conception of temple theology and the place of the feminine divine nature in Judaism slash Christianity. She mentioned that in Malachi 4.2, uh, which goes, uh, And risen to you, ye who fear my name, hath the Son of Righteousness, and healing in its wings. And ye have gone forth, and have increased as calves of a stall. Uh, That's Young's literal translation. The pronoun next to wings is actually feminine, so that a proper translation might read, healing in her wings, and this denotes the prophecy of the arrival of Sophia, which she, Barker, ties into the lady in the temple and so forth. I looked over many translations, Young's literal being my favorite for issues like this, as I find that... uh, he will translate literally and not allow Christian theology to get in the way. Barker mentioned that some translations, instead of using the more common its wings, will even translate the pronoun as his wings. I wondered why this was until I read a few commentaries and realized they overwhelmingly took this passage as a prophecy of Jesus. Still, they would often note that the pronoun is feminine, in the words of one commentary, his, her, denoted universal being, so 
it's is a more literal translation here. My first question is, do you think Barker is right to read the feminine pronoun as important theologically to this passage in Malachi, or is this just a descriptor of the actual son in a feminine manner? Uh, well, it does seem to be kind of a metaphor, uh, the the he- healing and all that uh, uh, being like a prerogative of God. Uh, it, I think the the bits and pieces of evidence she gleans are likely to be very important because her whole point is that editors have tried to expunge this stuff from the Bible and it's sort of odd to think of these bits and pieces as some kind of goofs. Isn't it more likely that we're dealing with loose ends? People forgot to tie up so I think uh, she makes a pretty good case. Okay, um, Justin says, now I have a somewhat unrelated question, which is what has prompted me to look more into Barker's work. This one will require um, my personal backstory for once. I apologize for the length in advance. I, I don't think anybody minds that, Justin. He says, I grew up Southern Baptist in Florida and dropped my conception of an active God after reading Elie Wiesel's Night dawn and day stories. I couldn't sing in church anymore because the very idea of invocation was offensive to me. Why would a god care about helping your bursitis and not stopping much more horrific tragedies in the world? Shouldn't we just shut up and do everything in our power to get him to ignore our petty concerns and focus on the big stuff? Our God is a great God. He can even find parking spaces, as Anal Roberts, I think, once said. Sorry. After a few years of not thinking about religion very much, I started listening to historical lectures to pass the time and came on to a series from the Teaching Company on the Western tradition. It was through the discussions on philosophy in the Bible, uh, the historical Jesus, and the Neoplatonic idea of the divine... Uh, that I eventually chipped away at the very conception of a god's existence. Since listening to your podcast, I've toyed with the idea of Christian atheism, though a theological perspective uh, of the death of God, while interesting, doesn't really grab me on its own. However, Barker's work puts Christianity in a much larger and more fascinating cultural tradition. My partner is Jewish and takes her heritage very seriously, though she's not pious, and in, fi- and in fact finds Asherah worship fascinating. One of the first things I noticed when I first went to her place was the book The Hebrew Goddess by Raphael Patai, a great book, uh, with her coming from a very liberal and non-Christian background, uh, during uh, background near Washington, D.C., and me in a Southern Baptist dom- dominated area, there are big cultural differences between us which can lead to misunderstandings. My jabs at religious beliefs, for instance, strike her as a need to rebel against my religious upbringing. The same comments and jokes are perfectly understood for what they are amongst my friends who grew up in the same churches and area, but she hears anti-religious intent in them. Her influence has led me to consider what positives I might take away from my Christian upbringing. Barker's work is the first thing that has struck a personal and not just academic resonance, though the two are always connected for me. And I wonder what your opinion is on what the implications of her research, her research can have for those of us who are cultural Christians. Uh, quote unquote. I didn't grow up with Barker's understanding of the Bible, so adopting the cultural aspects of it seem inauthentic to me. But there is... But is there some way to adopt the same position as those who are culturally Jewish, identifying oneself as Christian and yet understanding the divine in terms of First Temple ideas, where the lines between polytheism and monotheism become blurred without actually applying it to a belief in God or even in a divine realm or afterlife? Uh, yeah, I uh, I think so because it's if you're a cultural Christian, I, you'd think I'd have read this before based on what I said in answer to the last question. Um, I think being a cultural Christian and appreciating the the traditions of it includes um, 
appreciating all of the theological traditions clashing and conflicting and interacting. Once at the Jesus Seminar, I said, you know, I don't believe, I have no religious beliefs but I anymore, but I love the whole tradition, the orthodoxy, the heresy, everything. It's just fascinating, and I love it. Uh, I'm not going to start bashing religion. I will point out the absurdities that I think come out of literalism, uh, but uh, what I'm doing there is to safeguard what I believe is important about the religion, the power of myth, etc. I'm not attacking it. I think the people I am debating with are the ones who are, in effect, enemies of the faith, ironically. They're well-meaning and all of that, but it it does, uh, especially with apologetics, force them into intellectual dishonesty. But, uh, yeah, I think, uh, and the uh, Asherah business and all of that, the polytheistic traditions, sure, uh, they're uh, part of that rich uh, tapestry uh, of the Bible, uh, Old and New Testaments. There's no particular reason, in my opinion, you ought to feel bound to the Deuteronomic orthodoxy that Barker says was imposed, not entirely successfully, Uh, Because, in fact, uh, if you like Christianity, as Barker says, a lot of that stuff they tried to get rid of in ancient Israelite faith resurfaced in uh, Philonic Judaism and Gnosticism and Christianity and so on. So, yeah, I I would think uh, you you need to just open all the doors and there would be much to love and celebrate. When I was taking communion, uh, I would, in the Episcopal Church, Far from undermining my reverence for it, my knowledge of how this was cut from the same cloth as the ancient mystery religions, and that uh, taking the body and blood of Christ was the same sort of thing and even evolved from the uh, the mysteries of Osiris, to me that lent a, a much greater age and depth to the whole thing. It didn't make me think, oh, this is a lot of BS. Uh, Look at this. It's just more myth. No, no. The myth is the important part. Uh, I have an article in the very latest issue of the Christian New Age Quarterly called The Mythic Power of the Atonement. So, yeah, I think once you realize that the myth is the powerful part, it only gets more powerful the wider the scope of the myths. So uh, go get him, I say. Anthony Battaglia says, I was wondering about your thoughts on John twenty twenty eight when Thomas exclaimed, My Lord and my God, to Jesus. Does this indicate that the author believed Jesus to be God, perhaps not the God, since just verses before Jesus refers to the Father as my God, John twenty seventeen. Uh, Not clear, just as uh, Wainwright says in his great book, um, The Trinity in the New Testament, uh, there isn't any explicit teaching about the Trinity. It's kind of like what, uh, it's a great case of what Tillich said about the Bible, not speaking ontologically, as he called it, or philosophically, but raising those questions implicitly. Well, that's kind of what uh, Wainwright says, that uh, the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity, but you can see how people went from the Bible to Trinitarianism, especially in the Gospel of John. You see stuff like this and say, well, what is the deal here? What did John the Evangelist think? Was Jesus a worshiper of the Father who was God? Or um, is is uh, Jesus, is it okay to call Jesus God? Uh, and in what, then, in what sense? Because very obviously and overtly in John's gospel, Jesus prays to the Father. Is he praying to himself? Uh, well, of course, Margaret Barker kind of explains that too. Jesus is supposed to be Yahweh and the Father is El Elyon, more uh, surviving Jewish polytheism. But uh, I don't think John's gospel really understands that. So what is going on? I think you do begin to see the glorification of Jesus that is going to place him in the Trinity. Uh, But I don't think there's any way to systematize what John says without 
recognizing that it is sheer speculation to do that, but that you do kind of have to speculate because something is going on here. Uh, it's not just stupid inconsistency. You, know, you forgot what he said a few verses above. Uh, it's uh, something is is bubbling here and percolating, and we know where it ended up in the Trinity. And there are other ways that it ended up with other people, and uh, you got to call them as you see them. But uh, I would think he probably does mean it. But who knows? Because there's there's also Marcionite material in the Gospel of John, and they believed in two gods, right? Uh, so, uh, like in Second Corinthians, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So it's it's tough to be definitive about what uh, what uh, John has in mind, uh, but it does sound like he's saying uh, yeah, he's having Thomas uh, invoke. Jesus standing in front of him as as uh, the Lord and God. Um, okay, one last one from uh, Dane Butler um, uh, from Australia. You mentioned a couple of times you consider Polycarp to be the ecclesiastical redactor, and while it makes a lot of sense, I came across something that may not be new, but something that stuck out in my mind in regards to Luke and Acts. Luke and Acts appear to be written to most excellent Theophilus, which apologetics um, appears to claim to be a nobody or allegorical, namely, you know, the one who loves God or is beloved by God, uh, namely, the, namely the reader. Uh, to me, this doesn't make much sense with a most excellent pat, which rings, which reeks of high status. Is there any good reason for or against the possibility of Luke, quote unquote, whoever it was, um, uh, writing his books to Theophilus of Antioch? It seems to me that this will eliminate Polycarp as the author, as it appears Theophilus became bishop long after Polycarp's death, and it will place Luke Acts in the late second century. Is there any mention of the Gospel of Luke before this time? It is probably or even possible. Is it? It is. Sorry. Is it probable or even possible that Justin Matter, when it's assumed he's quoting Luke, could be quoting Marcion's Gospel of the Lord, or does he mention Luke by name? I don't think he does. He talks about the memoirs of the apostles, which is so vague we're not, we can't even be sure he's talking about the Gospels. And his quotes from Jesus combine uh, elements that we find in our uh, Matthew and Luke did he take the trouble to combine them, usually pointlessly? I mean, just, you know, they're they're slightly different. And you've got bits and pieces of both. Are they memory quotations from those Gospels or what? We don't know. But Justin Martyr would be around 175 A.D. or C.E. He would be the first reference to the book of Acts if uh, a, a certain phrase he uses... Um, something about the beginning in Jerusalem and carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth or something. I think that's it. If that is an allusion to Acts, but it's it's just a phrase and it's not that hard to come up with, so nobody really knows. Uh, I think the uh, dates may work out. Uh, I think uh, Polycarp and uh, Theophilus can be viewed as contemporaries. I, I say it that vague way because I'm not sure if we know the exact dates. But uh, Stefan Huller has argued for this. And, uh, oh man, one of these uh, no, late 19th, early 20th century uh, writers who were Christ mythicists and so on also argued this. And uh, that's, I think that is what's, uh, what's in implied that he that it's Polycarp writing to Theophilus of Antioch uh, I, of course and I think that even if we didn't know that uh, Luke is much better dated into the second century by some decades than uh, well, for a lot of reasons that I explore at some length in my introduction to Luke and Acts in uh, the pre-Nicene New Testament uh, even if we didn't have the mention of Theophilus Let's see. Okay, well, I guess that's it for today. I got to get off to see uh, 
the adventures of Superman on me TV and uh, so forth. But uh, I'll try to be back together with you pretty soon, and I much appreciate your being with me on the Bible Geek. See you later. <laughs> The Bible Geek was recorded by Robert M. Price and produced by John Felix and Sergeant Yovanovich. Theme song by John Morris. Visit us at robertmprice.mindvendor.com for more info on Robert's projects, purchase Bible Geek merchandise, and click the ever-important Donate button. Send your questions to criticus at aol.com and be sure to rate and review The Bible Geek on iTunes. Thanks for listening to The Bible Geek. I'm Torn Anderson. placed on the firing line So you'd better brush the dust from that old Bible And look up to the stars when they shine